Hello, this is Braden Kelly of bloggingintnovation.com here with Mary McDowell of Nokia. Just going to have a, a quick chat here at the Economist Conference on Innovation about sort of the, the future of the, the mobile world and some of the, the, the key insights that are driving it and how some of the things that are changing in the mobile marketplace. So, so for example, uh, one of the main things that's happened over the last year or two is that the, the people are ready now for the, the personal computer to be even more personal and to have the computer go to their hand and be with them at all times. So. So as we talk about that, and as we talk about the, the ecosystem that's evolving to support that, um, what are some, some things that you see developing uh, and some of the, the keys that you see going forward for uh, success for, for Nokia? Yeah, you know, th we come from a world that was largely a hardware game, which is about having great relationships with your suppliers, really good efficiency in f factories and distribution, which is all still important, but it's not sufficient anymore. Uh, so to your point, it's really what now goes on top of the hardware that makes it more interesting uh, for the consumer. And we see a real uh, dichotomy between the Western world and some of the growth economies. Um, in the Western world, it's about taking the chaos of information that people have access to and starting to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And so you hear a lot about the sensors in a device now. With the GPS, we now know your location. We probably know what social network you subscribe to. Um, you know, ultimately, we'll know your temperature, your blood pressure, you know, kind of everything about you. But we can use that to start to filter. And now, you know, if we know you're in San Francisco, only serve up the restaurant information that would be relevant to you. Or uh, the apocryphal tale of your college roommate happens to be in the bar at the airport as you're waiting for a delayed flight. You know, all those services now start to become a reality. Uh, in the growth economies, it's different because they lack the basic access to information. So there, it's really just taking that first step. Um, and we're seeing in many countries, India, Indonesia, mobiles are much more pervasive than PCs and because of the price point will continue to be so. And so it's likely to be the, um, the mobile will be the mechanism for accessing the internet or information. So we're rolling out services such as Nokia Life Tools, primarily for rural communities, which are about uh, providing information on crop prices or fish catch prices uh, to people so they can optimize the, the price they get for their work. Uh, English language lessons, horoscopes, uh, basic email. We rolled out an email service last year, and you sit here and say, well, there's Yahoo, there's Gmail, who needs another one? But in, in these countries, most, most of the Western email services don't let you sign up from a mobile. You have to sign up from a PC, and then you could use it on a mobile. If you don't have a PC, you're kind of stuck. Uh, our service is mobile first, and I think you're going to see a lot of new capabilities uh, go in that direction. So kind of two different worlds. One, s sort out the clutter, and the other is really just get you connected with the wider world so you can use that information to make better choices. Okay, and uh, mm -hmm. when, we, when we think about Nokia and we think about the developing world, Nokia has done a lot to create devices that are very affordable in that, that part of the world. Um, at, and the services that you're talking about, are those going forward going to be uh, delivered on smart devices, dumb devices, something new that might be coming? Or? Right. Uh, well, these are being delivered today on 20 and 30 euro devices, so a very low end of the range, and then uh, the, the service works via SMS, so using very low cost uh, technology in order to provide the service. So it, you know, given um, the customer that we're targeting, you don't want to have to depend on uh, 3G and other networks that aren't necessarily as pervasive in those markets. And what do you think are some of the, the key barriers or the key opportunities for moving some of those markets forward to devices that might be more capable? Yeah, um, you know, really, if you look at a country like India, it's kind of a microcosm of the world. We sell a lot of high-end devices, too. It's just that they have this unique uh, opportunity, as, as I said, with Indonesia, Nigeria, some of these other countries to address uh, some of the low-end Africa, yeah, other parts of Africa, some of the low-end segments as well. Um, and I think once you get people hooked on, on mobiles, and, and I guess maybe I'm an optimist, but I'm a believer in that use of technology can help with your individual life and potentially individual prosperity. So if I help you as a farmer get a better price for your crops, you're going to have more money, and then ultimately you can buy up the technology food chain. So I think there's a lot of altruistic benefits. Uh, we're definitely not an NGO. We're not a charity. We're in this to make money. But I think overall there's a societal benefit that you know, as societies prosper, they're going to buy higher-end technology. Okay, and uh, amongst all the things that are sort of emerging, uh, what are what insight or what technology do you think is most exciting for the, for the world and and either the developing or the developed wow. world? Wow, um, gosh, that's hard. Um, 
you know, I think at one end of the spectrum, it's it's uh, research in machine learning and how do you make sense of all the data points that you can gather from the community of mobile devices to start to do predictive things. Uh, we're doing a lot of work um, with uh, Berkeley, actually, and uh, U.S. Department of Transportation and traffic monitoring using GPS probes. Uh, that's sort of commonplace, but you could apply that to flu. You could apply that to, you know, other sorts of societal trends. Um, and I think at the other end of the spectrum, you know, material science, nanotechnology to actually make the device more efficient, solar powered, recyclable. Uh, so both at the software end and at the hardware end, a lot of cool innovations coming down the pipe. Okay, sounds good. One last thing. One, uh, one of the things that I like to talk about when we think about the mobile device and, and the place for the mobile device in the world is that it seems like we're at a point where the mobile device is getting powerful enough where it could start to be the main screen for people and not the, the third or the fourth screen for people. Um, so is Nokia doing any work on creating an extensible device that allows the, 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 the mobile device to be potentially the primary device and, and the laptop or the PC to take a second, second seat? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think it is the pervasive device just because it's the one that's always with you and always turned on. And maybe five years ago, people thought of the mobile domain as somehow isolated from the PC world or the TV world, and that's not the case. If I'm watching something on my mobile, when I walk into my living room, I want it to pop up on the big screen and enjoy the, the benefits of that sort of environment. So, you know, those are definitely capabilities that we're working on. To, it, and it's all about being consumer-centric. What does the person want to do as they go about their life instead of thinking in, in device silos? Okay, well, very good. This has been Braden Kelly of bloggingInnovation.com here with Mary McDowell of Nokia. And thank you very much, Mary. Thank you.